Hello, welcome back to Zinc Sterling. I'm Tim Zink, and in this video we will be covering how to make shadow box settings. On screen now is a list of materials that I used in this video. You can make adjustments to things like the bezel strip sizing to match the cabochon you're using, or the thickness of silver if you would like a chunkier, heavier piece. Also, of course, you can change out the stone. The rest of the tools are just what I used in this video. Some of them are optionals, like an engraving machine and an engraver. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if I leave any questions unanswered in the video itself, please feel free to comment below. Thank you, and enjoy the video. In this first clip, I am laying out the overall design of the piece. I decided to go with a round setting and an oval cabochon. I had a rough idea of what I wanted this piece to look like before I started, but here I'm just using dividers to decide an exact size for the overall ring setting. At this point I grab my jeweler's saw and I cut out the circular shape that will be the top part of the setting that will be seen from the front around the stone. Once I have this circle cut, I just use a file to clean up the edge. If you have a disc cutter, you could skip the cutting step and just use a disc cutter to punch out a perfect circle, but seeing as every stone's a different size, I like to just make an overall front setting that fits the stone that I'm using at the time. Here I begin to use my red marking pen to just lay out roughly how I think the piece is going to look overall in the front. This is just to make sure that I didn't cut the circle too big or too small, that I actually have enough material to work with to make the overall design. I try to hold away from the stone about two millimeters when I'm drawing my dots. That way whenever I lay out the overall design, I'll have some room for the bezel to fit on the inside after I cut the center piece out. You'll see that step further on in the video. Now that I've decided that I'm happy with the way the design looks and I think it's going to work out, I grab my carbide scribe and I only trace the inside portion, the oval that will be the overall inside part cut out. This next step is to actually dome that piece that we just cut out. So I place the design face down in the dapping block that way, the oval that I had scratched in with the carbide scribe is still present whenever I'm done doming this piece. The silver was feeling a little tough, so I decided to go through an annealing cycle. It actually works out great because that permanent marker that I use disappears right when the silver hits its annealing temperature. And then I quench it in water, and then we'll begin the dapping process again in a smaller dome. 
Now that the dapping is complete, I will grab one of my larger coarse files. This is so I can flatten off the bottom part so that this piece can be soldered to our back plate after I cut the design out of the top. At this point, I'll be using my red permanent marker again, it's a very fine tip, to go back over the oval that I had originally drawn with the scribe so that I don't lose it, and also I'll lay out the rest of the design that I'll be cutting out. I'm doing all this spacing by eye just because I've done designs similar to this many times. Uh, if you wanted a more exact measurement, you could measure the diameter of the circle, use your, cal your dividers and get exact spacing. I personally just kind of go for a freehand thing most of the time. Just depends on how I'm feeling and if the design's coming out the way I want it. Here I'm laying out the arches of each of the scallops, that way I can get an idea if the piece is actually going to look good or not before I even start cutting because at this point I just have a domed piece and if I decided that I didn't like the layout I could always use this piece of silver for another project. Once I've decided that I like the way it looks, I go ahead and grab my carbide scribe and now I'm doing all the straight lines and then I'll also go over the top of the arches so that everything's very clear to see when I start to do the saw work. Before I can cut out the middle part, I have to drill a couple of pilot holes. I drilled three, even though the piece was small enough that I only really needed one, 
but that way in case I broke a blade I had a starting point that might have been close to where the blade broke. Now that my pilot holes are drilled, I go ahead and set the piece into thermal lock, and this is so I can do an engraving of the initial cuts. I find it's easier to do the engraving step before the cutting step. That way the tip of your engraver doesn't catch on the edge of the silver and cause bad roll-ups or tears in the edge of the silver. Once again, this step isn't necessary. You can just file in all these cuts with a file. I like to do just a nice engraving cut to start it off so that my file has a channel to follow and it's less likely to slip out. Now that all my engraving cuts are made to guide my file, I move back over to my bench pin and I go ahead and cut out the center section. Something else to remember before you start your cuts is to go ahead and put some burr life on your saw blades just so they last a little bit longer, makes them not catch up and gum up near as badly as if you just run them dry. Now that the center section is cut out, I'm going to go ahead and make some guide marks. And that's because I'm going to actually take my jeweler saw and I'm going to cut about a third of the way down each of the engraving lines that I've made. And that's going to make the scallop look deeper overall in the final design and not so two-dimensional. And here you can see that I'm actually making those cuts that I talked about previously. Believe it or not, simple little tiny additions like cutting a third of the way down on the scallops 
really changes the overall look of the design and it really makes the piece look a lot more detailed. Now that I have the top section of my shadow box roughed out and pretty much done for now, I go ahead and go back to that same 0.5 millimeter piece of silver sheet and I'm going to go ahead and cut out a back plate that's slightly bigger than the circle that I started with. Now I move over to my bench block with that back plate. I'm going to go ahead and put my initials and the word Sterling on there stamped. And I put mine slightly off center and that's because I plan to have a ring shank right through the center of the back plate. Now it's time to solder the top piece to the back plate. I have my back plate elevated off my charcoal block about a quarter of an inch on two pieces of round steel that I just lay on my charcoal block and then I'll put my piece on top of it. That just helps the heat flow around it a little easier and a little more evenly. Here I'm putting some Mighty Flux, which is the brand I use. It's a self-pickling flux. You don't have to use that. You can use Borax Flux or flux paste, whatever you're comfortable with using. I just personally learned how to do most of my silversmithing with Mighty Flux, so that's the what I use. And then here I'll just use hard solder, and I'm going to stick solder the top piece to the back plate. I could have used solder chips and probably saved a little bit of solder, but seeing as I'm just going to, it'll go into my melt pile, I'm not super worried about the little bit of solder waste. Now that the piece is all soldered up and it's ran through a pickling cycle, which I just use vinegar and salt for my pickle, everybody has their own preference. That's just what I use, vinegar and salt in the crock pot. It's simple and easy, gets the job done, it's fairly quick. Now it's just time to cut off the excess silver around the edge. Had a saw blade break on me here, so I just had to switch over to a new one. And that's because most of the time I have a bad habit of not putting burr life on my saw blades before I begin my cuts.
Now that I have all my sawing complete, I go back to that same feather file you see, saw me use before. I'm going to use this to clean up the edge, get any excess metal left over, and just flush everything up and make it look nice and round. This feather file is nothing specific. I honestly picked it up from a hardware store. I'm not sure what the cut on it is. It's just something I used for rough cleaning up edges. It's not something I use for finishing pieces by any means. And once I got the edges and the shape cleaned up adequately, I'll go ahead and go around the back edge and just take the burr off the back edge of the piece. Sticking with that same file, I'm going to go ahead and go in each of those lines that I engraved. I'm just going to cut them a little bit deeper and I'm going to wrap that cut around the edge of the piece. Now that I have those cuts deepened, they still look a little two-dimensional, so I'm going to actually take a triangle file and I'm just going to run the edge of it through those cuts again. It's going to widen out that cut and it's going to make the scallops look a little more rounded on the top. It's going to give the piece just a little bit more dimension and honestly it'll give it quite a bit more contrast whenever I go ahead and use liberal sulfur later on. 
And here, once again, I'm going to use that same feather file just to clean up the top of this piece and make sure there's no uneven spots. I just, I'm just going over it to make sure that any high or low spots are evened out and the overall piece is a good, nice, rounded shape. Now that I have the shadow box on my piece completed, this is where I go into making a bezel for my cabochon. And I suggest just using a bezel wire that's appropriate in height for your shadow box. You want your bezel wire to come slightly above the edge of however tall your shadow box is so that you have some room to actually set the stone. Because if you set a bezel super deep into the shadow box, then you're having to use uh, bezel pushers that are real thin. It can be kind of hard to actually get in there and set a stone properly. And you don't want to accidentally slip with a bezel pusher and put a big dent in the top of your shadow box because then you basically have to start all over at that point. Now that I got my bezel soldered together, it's still out of shape, so I'm going to go ahead and use just a couple of steel rods in there, a rawhide mallet, I'm going to get it pushed to a round shape, I'm going to file off whatever excess solder on the seam is, and I'm just going to overall make it the right shape and make it look right so that it fits around the stone nice and snugly and still fits inside of our shadow box setting. 
And there we got a nice good fit for our cabochon. At this point we take the shadow box, we're going to line up the bezel so that it's in line with how we cut our oval in the top of the shadow box in the first place. This one you can see that it's pretty close on the ends and a little wider on the sides. Uh, depending on what you're going for in your look, you can space that out and make it uh, quite a bit more space between your shadow box and your bezel. Or you can tighten it up to where it's almost on top of each other but not a solid piece. Just depends on what you're going for, how tight of a pattern you want. And then at this point, once again, I have my my setting up on top of two pieces of steel just so that I can get more flow. I'm going to add a little bit more Mighty Flux, and then you'll see me put solder chips in there, heat the piece up, and that'll just solder the bezel in place. Now that the bezel is soldered into our shadow box, it's time to cut the ring shank. I'm cutting it right at where my uh, diagram says seven and a half. That's honestly so that there's a little space in between because of the way I like to do my shanks. And overall this ring will end up a size eight. Here, now that I have my shank to shape, I'm just moving it up and down my mandrel to space out the gap so that it sits right out of size 8 because that's the size of ring that I'm going for. And then I take a file, I'm just going to start cutting right across the top of that space and the goal is to keep this cut as level as possible so that it'll stand on the back of the setting by itself when you go to solder it, but also you want to thin it down so that it comes to just a nice thin wedge so that you don't have any step up on the back of your ring that's going to catch on someone's finger. <laughs> 
And now that I've decided that I've filed it flat enough and deep enough, I just stand it on the back just to make sure that it stands up on its own. If it's left or right crooked, you can make those adjustments. Here I'll be soldering the shank onto the back of our setting. The way I set it up is so that the TZ was actually up and down in the same orientation as the stone. That way I have some kind of identifying marker for whenever I'm soldering on the shank so that I know that it's not crooked or off center since the overall back is just round. And once again, I've used Mighty Flux. I've heated it up so the flux turns white. And then I've added a couple of chips of Easy Solder and I start to heat the overall piece. You'll see that the solder only flows on the right side of the shank at first. And the left side actually doesn't flow, you don't see it. So I end up adding another secondary little piece of silver solder to the left side of it. And right there, you can see the solder actually starts to flow right there. At this point, I have already wet sanded the piece up to a 600 grit. And the reason I don't show that on camera is because everybody has their own techniques for sanding. I personally like to wet sand my pieces. Uh, honestly, everybody has their own style of doing it. There's a dozen videos on YouTube of how to sand silver to a finish. I take it from 220 up to 600 grit. It's a long process and it's not something that I can really condense and put into a video very easily. Here I've just added some liver of sulfurs to some hot water. It was just out, just out of the microwave so the water was almost boiling. The piece turns nice and dark, a nice charcoal black color. Take it out, rinse it off, neutralize it, and you end up with this like matte black and then I'm just taking 5 aught steel wool to brush the top the high surfaces so that you get all your deep cuts stay that nice black the inside of the shadow box stays black but everything else is a nice fine shiny silver And now that the piece has been taken over with 5 aught steel wool and it's given it that nice look, the contrast, I didn't accidentally take any of the black out of the cuts, everything looks good. I like to use a hardwood dust behind my stones, especially varicite and turquoise. Some people have an issue with putting organic materials into 
rings and jewelry. And I understand that the wood can expand over time, but it also acts as a shock absorber. And with turquoise and verisite, you run a lot higher risk of a stone cracking if you say drop your piece of jewelry or you smack it against a counter or a wall. And so adding that shock absorber behind it is, uh, in my experience, a really good idea to do because I've broken several stones, either setting them without any sort of shock absorber behind them, or after I've made the piece, they've fallen off the counter, they've smacked into a wall, and there goes your stone, your piece is ruined, and you gotta cut a new stone for it, or start all over depending on you know, how specific the shape was. I find it's just easier to add a shock absorber, and it's more reliable, and I've dropped many rings. In fact, after this video is done filming, I dropped this ring and it landed straight on the stone and the stone's still fine, it didn't break. Everything was perfectly fine. Whereas if I hadn't had that sawdust behind it, there's a good chance that that verisite would have cracked right across the face of it. Now that the stone is set, the very last step is to polish it and clean it with soap and water. The polish that I'm using in this video is I use a range of polishes from Rio Grande that I ordered. They're actually platinum polishes. They have a platinum one, two, and three. I use the second stage because I find for me personally that puts the nicest finish on sterling silver that I've found. I know a lot of people use different stages of rouge or things to that nature. I personally, this is my go-to polish for my silver jewelry because I find it doesn't leave micro abrasions, it leaves a nice finish, and it overall is a really good polish for sterling silver. I'm gonna go over the face, I'm gonna make sure I get the edges of the bezel. I'm just gonna really take my time with the face of this, and I'm always making sure to never go straight up and down any of those lines, because I don't wanna accidentally polish the contrasting black line out of the piece of silver. And then I finish off with a shank. And that just about finishes up our video. If you liked the video, please like and share it. If you learned anything, please let me know in the comments. If there's anything I missed that you think was ambiguous or didn't I didn't cover well enough, please let me know in the comments. I reply to almost every single one of them. I really hope you enjoy the video and have a great day.